Welcome everyone, good afternoon uh, for the final panel of the day. I'm happy to see that there are still folks in the audience uh, and uh, we are the only thing that stands between you and the cocktail portion of the program. So we promise uh, on behalf of all the panelists to be concise without sacrificing quality here. Um, so why don't we kick things off with a brief introduction by each of our panelists on who they are and what their background is. So, Jack, will you start us? Sure, I'm Jack McCollum. I'm the uh, chairman and CEO of Senseo. I spent most of my life as a practicing doc. Actually, I thought earlier that looking at the people that were in the room, that we could maybe solve the physician shortage if they'd make us all go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I helped uh, start a, uh, an IPA that's now 600 physicians and manages about 30,000 uh, MA lives, about a third of which are in their own health plan. Uh, then from there I morphed into risk adjustment right at the very beginning of risk adjustment. Uh, started one of the uh, one of the first of the chart review pro uh, companies for that purpose. And toward the end of that experience uh, realized that a lot better information could be obtained uh, in a lot of cases if you actually got in front of the members rather than in front of their paper. And we started, a, we started Senseo. Uh, we do in-home evaluations. We use physicians to go out into people's homes and do Medicare Advantage members' homes and, and do evaluations of their diagnostic situation, their home situation, and so forth. We'll do about 400,000 of those this year uh, in 40-plus states. So it's, a, it's a, pretty broad, a pretty broad program. We work for uh, 34 or 5 MA plans, something like that. My name is Keith Dunleavy. I'm the president and CEO of Innovalon. Uh, we take data, healthcare data, uh, petabytes of healthcare data from a nationwide basis, uh, touching about half of the insured United States. We analyze that data and identify the difference between what is current state and desired state. That each one of those differences we call a gap. It might be a gap in risk adjustment accuracy, like Jack just touched about might be a gap in quality improvement, it might be a gap in utilization, safety, a number of other areas. We then utilize the data further to inform us in a behavioral modeling predictive capability to determine what's the best way to close this gap. Is it through the member? Is it through the provider? Is it through the hospital system? What's the right venue? Is it in their living room, uh, as Jack would do? Is it uh, at a partnered center? Is it at a minute clinic? Is it in the hospital? Is it in the doctor's office? Is it in the mailbox? Is it on the telephone? And then use further analytics to say, well, when do we need to do this? Do we need to do it in January, the beginning of the data service period, or do we need to do it at the end of the year? Uh, why would we do it sooner? Why would we do it later? And then when you layer all these different gaps, each one having a different value to the member, the provider, the payer, um, what does that mean about something that you might not have otherwise wanted to do until July if there's something that also has some value in February? Do you move February back to July or do you move July up to February? So there are some rather complicated analytics around this and then there is an intervention capability that's necessary to bring this to fruition, right? Very few people like paying a lot of money for the information that sits on a CD-ROM. Here's the answer, go do something with this, trust me, it's valuable. Very few companies you ever invest in uh, would be successful with that business model. You need to take it through to fruition. You need to be able to say, these are the best analytics in the industry, and I'll prove it by following it all the way through to value demonstration. So any organization you look at, uh, one of the things I would strongly advise is make sure that if they say they improve things, their calculations need to be able to demonstrate it. Just look to the disease management world if you're not sure about that. So we do not only the analytics and the intervention, we do this now touching about 120 million Americans, uh, about half of the insured United States, uh, their healthcare organizations, about 540,000 physicians, about 220,000 uh, clinical facilities. We have about 5,000 uh, employees, uh, and uh, it is obviously in the setting of a dramatically expanding marketplace of demographic forces behind Medicare Advantage the state privatization of Medicaid and managed Medicaid, 
uh, and now the arrival of the ACA commercial exchange marketplace, this is a massive, roughly about $28 billion uh, marketplace. $28 billion in uh, risk adjustment uh, impact, quality, incentive impact, utilization, incentive impact, and other uh, state-based uh, uh, incentive programs. So it's a big deal to the healthcare marketplace. Very few players in the managed Medicare, managed Medicaid, or commercial exchange marketplace can successfully survive in what is a zero-sum game. If they fail, they don't only lose that dollar, they pay that dollar to their competitor marketplace. So the forces at play are very massive. The growth rates uh, are very significant. The member wins, the provider wins, and the successful uh, payer wins. Um, my name is Shane Pata, uh, Chairman and CEO of a company called Health Integrated. Um, we work with uh, health plans who are our customers, partners across the country, commercial, Medicare, Medicaid, and we help them manage their most uh, vulnerable and fragile uh, populations. So in the case of a commercial health plan, that is probably about 10% of the population who creates 50 to 60% of the MLR, so that's where the cost is. In the case of a Medicaid population, it's about 30%, Medicare, 50 to 60, specialty populations like uh, age, blind, and disabled, or dual eligibles, it's 100% of the population. What sets us apart, uh, or what we think we do uniquely, is first of all, the way we view the whole exercise. It's very patient-centric, uh, and it's very holistic. Uh, sort of the inner circle is understanding the interplay between not just medical conditions, but behavioral health issues. Because we believe that while you can get a, a fair amount of stuff through st statistical analysis, it is impossible to predict how one particular person is wired. And you really need to understand what all the different motivational factors are if we're going to get the member engaged and change their health status. The second circle around that is social support. The third circle around that is data, so that you have the right intervention delivered to the right member at the right time. Uh, you know, we can come in and, and help uh, our, member, our, uh, our, our partners with a specific task, but generally what's happening more and more is they're carving out their entire troublesome populations to us. Think of us as sort of the general contractor where they're saying, hey, I have a SNP population or I have an MA population. I don't know what to do. You guys handle it. Everything from the stuff that Jack's talking about in terms of revenue maximization to how do you really bend the cost curve. Um, and so that they can be effective. And, and, and I think that sort of with the new competitive arena that's facing, you have to play both offense and defense. You can't just have one piece of the solution. So Sundar Subramanian, I'm a partner in um, a Boozin company uh, in the global health and operations practices. Um, I work primarily in, um, with Medicaid, Medicare clients in uh, post-reform changes, what, um, what they need to do to really impact cost as well as grow, and um, how they change the business model, as well as thinking about um, in this new world of uh, really learning, learning to actually, learning about their members, as well as learning to impact outcomes for them, how they can go about doing that. So um, clearly several distinguished products and gentlemen here, we look more broadly across how does that fit for business models for where payers need to go is where I focus a lot on. Thanks, and my name is Stu Rosenthal. I'm a partner at Gooden Proctor, um, member of their private equity practice group. Been there for about 14 years, and the co-head of the uh, healthcare services vertical within the private equity practice at Goodwin. And uh, honored to be sharing the stage with our panelists today. Um, okay, with that, um, the, so the concept of risk assessment, risk adjustment, I think, in very general, high-level terms, has been described by folks as techniques to improve the management and quality of health care and, and to maintain viable risk pools. But um, sometimes those terms are used interchangeably, incorrectly, uh, and they're really distinct concepts. So what I'd like to do to start and, and level set the discussion here is to unpack each of those terms. Uh, and I'd like to ask, uh, I guess, Keith, for your assistance, um, maybe with describing from your perspective, what is risk adjustment? Um, what is the history? How does it work? And why is it important? Take you back uh, into the 90s, right? So when the government started to look at ways to offload some of their responsibilities on managed care, you started to see a wave of privatization experiments. Uh, there were a number of early experiments, just a few states, roughly five originally in the Medicaid space, where they said, tell you what, um, we're going to determine the 
the average cost, the average risk exposure of certain populations, and then we're going to contract with you at that fixed rate based upon those metrics, and we'll update those numbers every once in a while. Um, they used data predominantly from the inpatient environment, uh, first of all, and what happened was a lot of cherry picking. So what happened was, this was predominantly in Medicaid, the organizations that won those contracts were marketing in the wealthy area instead of the lower income area. So the granularity needed to improve. And as you move through the 90s, you see these programs becoming more sophisticated, these initial trials done by CMS in partnership with certain states launched um, a more sophisticated approach to the granularity of the data that they utilized. They tried not only inpatient data in some studies, uh, but then they slowly and eventually moved to outpatient data as they uh, went from the late 90s into the early 2000s, the attention shifted to the 2003 Medicare Modernization Act. As that act began to grow in its momentum, the Medicaid states who were experimenting in this area took back burner and stopped progressing uh, the advancement of risk adjustment to see how the federal approach to risk adjustment would be. Um, obviously, the 2003 Medicare Modernization Act passed, and that launched Medicare Advantage. Initially, in 2005 and 6, when it really got off the ground, you were talking about 6 million members. 6 million members that were reimbursed based upon their individual ICD-9 diagnosis codes from particular periods of time, which happened to be predominantly a calendar-based system. So therefore, they in effect said, I'm eliminating cherry picking because each individual member's risk score will dictate how much we, the federal government, pay you for these members. And that was the unit of fairness. Well, the challenge was is that the system wasn't set up uh, to uh, have physicians those that enter these codes really be focused on that granularity. Why? Because the average Medicare Advantage member has eight, nine, ten different diagnoses, and if I'm really basing my payment as a doctor on my level of CPT code, level one, two, three, four, five, I don't really care about diagnosis six, seven, and eight. The claim system in most hospitals won't even return at that point in history diagnoses past number three or four. It oftentimes would truncate off the granularity of the fourth and fifth ICD-9 digit. For, so for a series of reasons, something we wrote up in a white paper back in 2007, there were about 12 different places that interrupted the accuracy of the actual disease and comorbidity status from between where the member exists and where CMS exists. And so systems, technologies, like some of the things Jack has worked on, some of the things we've worked on, have worked to fix that. So how big of a deal is it? It's about 8.1% on average swing in reimbursement per year. If you look at the managed um, care world, uh, an 8.1% swing is a really big deal to your bottom line. Medicare Advantage grew over the years. It came under great suspect as Obama became an increasingly likely candidate for office. It slowed in its growth rates. It is now at the highest growth rate it's been at, at approximately 10% per year. That is benefited from the concern of it being shut down, no longer being around, and the demographics of the Medicare base now growing organically quite well. Well, as Medicare Advantage became prominent, two other things also happened at the same time. The Medicaid organizations of the country said, this is being accepted, we now see how this works, let's do this more, an economic um, a downturn happened, and states needed to get this stuff off their liability list fast. So in a period of roughly three years, the managed Medicaid space has doubled, a 100% growth rate in managed Medicaid, almost the entirety of which is risk adjusted, has come onto uh, the landscape of US. As these have been successful, launch and enter the exchange marketplace. That which will go live in, uh, on January 1st, 2014, that which was an experiment, if, if called nothing else, in Massachusetts starting in 06, um, you have risk adjustment for commercial. So you now have the full triumvirate. You have Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial risk adjustment. You now have Medicare that has grown to 13 million members uh, today. Um, you have managed Medicaid that is roughly at about 35 million members, 
And on January 1st, 2014, depending on whose projections you believe, you're going to have somewhere between 20 and 35 million members in risk-adjusted commercial. You add that all up and you have somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 70 million members in the United States that their reimbursement to their payer is entirely dependent upon the accuracy of the data that reflects their disease and comorbidity and will leave the other uh, parallels that follow alongside this of similar um, incentivization to quality outcomes, utilization restrictions that have paralleled all this legislation. That is the risk adjustment marketplace. It's a state marketplace. It's a federal marketplace. It's complex. The data that is required to submit it right, go through audits properly, survive through audits properly, get the right risk adjustment, be able to tell Wall Street what your reimbursement's going to be, plan for it, market for it. It's a tough business, and those that do it right, because it is a technically a zero-sum game, although not legislatively required to be a zero-sum game, it's designed as one, means it is what we call at Anovalon accelerated Darwinism. You pick the right winner, and you win at twice the rate. It is really tough to compete against a competitor that for every dollar you gain, you actually get a $2 advantage over your competitor. Uh, it is a tough market. You're going to see the landscape over the next three years change extremely dramatically. Behind a lot of the M&A activity you're already seeing in these managed care spaces um, is a management team that knows they um, don't have an upper hand in this area. Um, so it is, a, it is a very, very dynamic force over the next few years. Great. Thank you, Keith. And uh, on the risk assessment side, Jack. Um, could you weigh in with um, some thoughts on how that works, maybe differentiate from risk adjustment or how they relate, interrelate with one another, really? When CMS originally in, in 03 embarked on this uh, risk-adjusted Medicare Advantage payment thing, the issue, as, as Keith sort of alluded to, was where do you get the diagnoses? Where do you, where do you go to get that information? And what CMS said in the original set of regs was that you have to get them from a very specific place. It has to be from a face-to-face -face encounter between an eligible provider and an eligible member in the year of service. It was really straightforward. The problem with that was the plans came back and said, but look, the average Medicare member has 7.1 charts. We can't go out, if we got only 50,000 members, we can't go out and look at 350,000 plus charts to try to find these diagnoses, to go look for these records. You've got to give us some other way to do it. And so as a matter of convenience, CMS said, okay, you can harvest the diagnoses from claims. However, when we want an audit, we don't want to see the claim, we want the chart behind the claim. So the first issue was, the plans looked around and said, now wait a minute, we know that doctors are lousy diagnostic coders because they don't get paid for diagnostic codes. They're terrible at it. And we know that there's going to be a lot of stuff out there in charts that aren't in claims. So why don't you let us do claims and then let us go mine some charts and see if we can find some other stuff that we can add on to the risk score. And CMS said, yeah, that's fine, you can do that. And that was sort of the first of the risk adjustment business models. That was my first company. We went out and figured out, we used all kinds of fancy algorithms to figure out who was missing diagnoses. And we'd go pull the charts and find the diagnoses. And the uh, plans would drop them, and CMS would up their payments. And that was all a nice little business model. The problem with that business model, in my mind, was that you can't do anything constructive for what happens with those members by looking at charts. You're moving money, and that's really all you're doing. It's a nice little business, but you're moving money. And it, we, we got involved in, we got involved in, a, in a project with, uh, with XL Health. It's a, we, were, we were actually sold as a package with XL in that first company. And as you may or may not know, XL, uh, was a Medicare Advantage company that took only chronic disease people. And they were going to succeed by being great managers of chronic disease. And you can sort of imagine how that worked out. Um, they, were, they lost a lot of money, and, and they got bought, and, and we were going to use risk adjustment to fix it. And what we did in that project was say, 
look, if you really want the information the best possible way, you don't go to the chart, you go to the person. You go get in front of the people. And we created for Excel the first of the, of the house call programs. Uh, it worked out very well for Excel. Excel did quite nicely. But more to the point, the house call idea uh, started to gain traction. Excel internalized that program. Uh, I started my company. There's a couple others around that do the same sort of thing. And, and it was working out pretty well. Actually, it worked out very well for the, for the company, that, for the private equity group that bought Excel. They bought it, I think, for about 300, well, I, they did buy it for 300 million, and they sold it for 2.4 billion. Uh, and, it, and what United bought the company for was the house call ability, was the ability to get out in front of members. Um, so that's kind of the evolution of risk assessments has gone from claims to charts, which are somewhat better than claims, to face-to-face -face visits, which are a lot better than either one. And that's been, the, that's been the evolution of the process. And I want to just make one more point, and then I'll shut up. The real beauty of risk assessment in that setting is that, yes, you do get the diagnoses right when you get in front of a member. But especially if you get in front of a member in their home setting, you get a window into everything else that's going on in their lives that you can't get any other way. You see their fall risk. You see what's in their medicine cabinet. We literally look in refrigerators to see if they have food. Uh, there are all kinds of direct benefits that you can get by being in that setting. So what you have is care management on, built on a revenue platform. Care management then is not an expense for the plans, it's a revenue generator. And it's a real different way to think about how all of this works. I was on a panel uh, a few months ago with Don Berwick, and Don said, if you want to find a place in American healthcare reform that's actually working, look at this. This works. And that's why uh, he left, I have strong feelings about the fact that he left, but, but he left with a legacy. Uh, he helped infuse risk adjustment into managed Medicaid. He made sure that risk adjustment was in the exchanges. Uh, and there are really good reasons. It, it aligns incentives in a very productive way. It's a really terrific program, and Keith's right. Uh, it's, a, it's a program that touches a huge number of lives and will touch a lot more. MA is growing. I mean, what was 41 or 2 percent of new to Medicare? New to Medicare's in, the, in this AEP went into MA. The baby boomer, boomers are flocking into MA. The number of states in, that risk adjust Medicaid, as Keith said, is, is expanding dramatically. We'll start with, I think, I think in her hearings, uh, Marilyn Tavener said that they were anticipating 7 million to start in the exchanges, but it'll go to 28 within a few years or 30 or so. Uh, and, and I love the Arkansas. Uh, the, the, the Arkansas application for a waiver, they want to use the, they want to move their Medicaids uh, into the exchanges. They just want to use the exchanges to do Medicaid. And there are six other states that are sitting right behind them that if that gets approved, will have the papers on the desk within a week. Uh, this, is a, this, is a pretty, this is a pretty lively area of, of management in healthcare. And, and one that I agree with Keith completely. I don't think it's one that's going to that's going to shrink anytime soon. Great, thanks, Jack. So with that as background, um, I think we all know that payers for a while have been trying to better understand their insured populations for a variety of reasons. Shane, um, could you maybe speak to some of the methods that payers are using? to understand their underlying members today, whether it be in the form of improved tech and new technologies, as I think we heard um, referred to on an earlier panel, um, use of third-party service providers, or, or otherwise, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it, that's such a broad topic, I don't even know where to begin. And, and, and partly, I'm sort of prejudiced by my own thinking, which is that I think it's a misnomer that health plans have traditionally been good at care management. It's quite frankly been an afterthought health plans have been good at two things, revenue maximization, whether it's in terms of uh, some of the stuff that Jack's talk talking about on Medicare side, Advantage side, in the case of commercial plans, I don't know of any other industry where you could regularly pass on 8 to 10% price increases and your customers had to shut up and take it. Uh, 
uh, Medicaid plans were really CHIP programs until a few years ago where you had single moms and, bunch, uh, uh, and kids. And you know, your biggest risk was a high, high risk pregnancy. So the concept of, of actually understanding their members and doing something about it is actually a brand new concept. Uh, there are a few uh, companies that are particularly well run, like United, who's way ahead of the pack. But if you look at the, the vast majority of them, they're just starting to. And so I think if it goes to generality, I think the first issue is that they're for the first time recognizing that they've actually got to look at their populations and figure out how to bend the cost curve. Um, and, and there's certainly a lot of, of, of data and stuff, but I think what they're also starting to look at is um, how, do they pro, you know, how do they target the, the, the high users? Uh, those, those folks, I mean, it, it's one, once again, it's, it's a small tail that's driving the vast majority of the cost. And they're trying to understand, is it because of, lack of access issues? Is it because of, of behavior issues where the members haven't, uh, don't, don't feel like they're engaged? So they're really starting to look at outside the box. Uh, they're also starting to, for the first time, get, and with Medicaid populations in particular, the whole social support issue. Uh, or we're seeing that with SNP populations. I mean, if, if, if you don't have that social support, you know, it's sort of the old saying that people are recognizing it takes a village uh, to raise a child. Well, it also takes a village to be able to take care and nurture the sick and fragile. Um, and so how do we supplement that with technology and, 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 and uh, other resources? So it's a pretty fundamental uh, 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 transformation that's going on. And it, yeah, and it doesn't really uh, work on sound bites, but I would simply say that I think that people need to recognize that really what's going on here is that care management for the first time in terms of condition management and, and managing patient behavior and how they access health care, uh, how they stay compliant, how they take ownership is a relatively new concept that uh, is in various stages of adoption across the industry. Anyone else uh, on the topic of methods payers are using to better understand their population? Let's take um, Shane's uh, comments about this member in commercial. So in the commercial space, this is going to launch. This is launching now. It's already out in some, some parts of the country. But you're going to have a base bid of, call it roughly, $340. Okay? Vermont just filed as the first publicly available exchange. You can all look up the documents. But Vermont is one of the most expensive in the country. So you shouldn't use that as your proxy for what the base premiums are going to be. So let's say. For the sake of this math, it's $340 PM, PM, right? That's going to be your base bid. Now, all the numbers I'm about to say get multiplied against that number in order for the payment to be determined of how many dollars you get for that member's care for that month. So demographic base, meaning age, gender, smoking, a bunch of other different criteria, are going to put you at about a 0.2 to a 0.3 in commercial, right? So uh, if you have no illnesses, they're making trivial amount. They're not even making. They're taking in a trivial amount. And I will tell you that the commercial risk adjustment model, the HHS model for HCCs under commercial risk adjustment is extraordinarily nonlinear. It's extraordinarily, um, the wrong word for it is exploitable, OK? It is very different depending on what age you're in and what diseases you have. OK, so let's go back to that point two. So in the Medicare space, my demographic base is a 0 0.6, 0 0.65, and my PMPM PM is about 850. You multiply those out. The national average, by definition, is 1. So my demographic base is 0 0.65. The other side of my bell curve is like a member with a 1.8. And you have to figure out where your members are in that space. If you don't know where your members are in that space, you don't know what you're going to get paid. But in the commercial space, I want you to see a totally different beta. This is going to be life and death in the commercial space. So in Medicare, everyone is sick. You can throw spaghetti at a wall, and every strand is going to stick. It's just how much money you're going to get for them. OK, so everybody lives between 0.6 and 1.8. That's a really narrow range. And I'm talking about an 80% bell curve here. So if I take that same bell curve and put it on commercial, I start at 0.25 and I go to 100. That's my range. I have some members that are bringing in a couple hundred bucks a month and some that are 50, 70, $80,000 a year. I have some preemies that are half a million dollars because they have a whole separate schedule for um, the pediatric cases. So we had one health plan call us up and say, you know what, I want to analyze my members. 
and everyone that was completely healthy last year, I don't want you to do any analytical work on them. I gotta save a few dollars. I said, let me tell you a few stats before you think about doing that. If you look at the members who were 100% healthy last year in commercial, how many of them will have material risk adjustment issues in the subsequent year? Half, right? Because in your commercial space, only 18 to 25% of your members have any risk adjustment revenue at all. Everyone else is demographic base. Compared to Medicare, where it's 70 or 80% are um, ill and only 20% are demographic base. It's complete opposite in commercial. So who are gonna be the ones you need to look at? If you can't do the analytics, you're dead, right? If you can't figure out who that member is gonna be that needs your attention and needs proper assessment of reimbursement rate, the difference between you getting it, $80,000, and not $200, there aren't that many health plans that can do that. So the math is unbelievably dramatic. Now some plans are saying, yeah, yeah, but it all evens out in the end. State by state, they're all rebalanced, there's reinsurance, you know, there's this 3% band, I'll be safe, I have a big balance sheet, I'll be okay. Just look at Massachusetts. 2006, they launched their risk adjustment marketplace. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts had an 80% market share. They said, we have a big balance sheet, we've got a great brand, we'll put out a premium. And along comes um, Neighborhood, I believe, um, comes into the market with next to nothing. Blue Cross Blue Shield has gone from 80% market share in five years they were down to a 20% market share. So the giant in the marketplace died because they ignored how important it was to get the premium number right and understand the risk score of their members while a barely heard of player came along and properly nailed where they should be mathematically. So you're gonna see tremendous turnover in the marketplace and ironically, being big doesn't help you now because it's just math. And in fact, if you're the 70% market share, you only get 30 cents of every benefit you achieve because the rest goes into the pool. All right, it's, an all, it's a balancing on the state level. It's a lot of math. Um, we have huge data centers and it takes us about 30 to 40 days to run each major healthcare systems analytics, which we cycle every month. I mean, it is massive number crunching to do this. Most, most plans are trying to do this on Excel sheets. Um, so it is, um, it, you're gonna see some really big changes in the marketplace over the next few years. Uh, Medicaid and the exchanges are genuinely zero sum. Medicare Advantage for some strange reasons is not. But here's the deal if you happen to be one of those private plans that, that ventures into the exchanges. You get your risk scores collected through the year at a member level, then they get rounded up through a formula that has not yet been published to a plan level risk score. If your plan level risk score is one, then you heave, heave a great sigh of relief and you don't do anything. If your plan level is, risk score is less than one, they send you a note and tell you how much of a check you have to write uh, about the first of March. And if you've done a really, really good job with getting your risk scores right, uh, they, uh, you get the check. It is very draconian, uh, and, and it's, it's concurrent. Your, your damage is immediate, and the damage can be quite significant. It's not coincidental neighborhood health plan in Centene where actually uh, Celticare were ma Medicaid plans that started winning in mm -hmm. Massachusetts, right? Um, there's clearly changing incentives now that is clearly recognized, but going back to kind of what, what did actually plans do traditionally, particularly in the commercial side, but even in the Medicaid side, to build off of um, Chan's point, is there, what care management, beyond just collecting the data and getting the right adjustments for it, what, what it was was really, even today, 80% of what plans do is just, you know, utilization management, which is calling, you know, physician, or, you know, giving authorizations for physicians who are um, already performing services, which is kind of still gatekeeping. And very little kind of, case management, disease management programs, which is primarily telephonic, right? You, you know, you hit some few high cost members, you call them, you try to keep them on programs or work them on the disease management on, you know, following protocol. But there was very little true, um, you know, surprisingly, right, for now decades, healthcare and health plans have never understood consumers like um, any other industry, like you, you, you have a pizza company, they know exactly Friday evening, 5 p.m., I need this toppings when, 
you know, uh, Keith comes back to work for it to sell a little bit more. And health plans have been complacent on that for now decades. And what this changes, which is very exciting, is in a real way, it's not just about, oh, better data collection leads to kind of better winners or winner-take-all model, but actually it gets them into thinking about care delivery. When you're in the home setting or long-term care setting, you're not there to just collect the data, but you can start influencing care, right, which is very exciting. And yeah. um, which is like, very exciting for another reason, that Medicaid and the populations that have been managed in Medicare or even many times in traditional Medicare Advantage are the moms and children or, um, you know, normally healthy adults. But if you see what is happening in the next three to five years, it's populations like the ABDs and folks that need real care and managed care is going to get into those populations which we have not had as much experience managing. And they're going to lose their shirts if they don't get into the care delivery side beyond just calling them on case management programs. And they, for the first time ever, they have an incentive to do that. Right? Uh, skilled nursing facilities uh, you know, have traditionally been uh, hotels. They, you know, I don't know if you've ever had a relative. I mean, you had to call around for five or six hours I mean, just to, to find a, a bed. Yet, all of a sudden now, um, a lot of them are scrambling because they started looking at the specter of having empty beds. It's basically a 3 to 5% net business. With some of the Medicare cuts, a lot of these guys are looking at some real challenges. So we started to broker a lot of relationships between our health plan uh, partners and SNFs, where you're pushing utilization management and decision down to actually the provider level. And so you're starting to see partnerships where people on the care delivery side have a lot more of upside, you know, and, the, and it can also be, uh, it can have a lot of teeth where, where there's penalties, but, it's, but the whole value proposition for providers is changing as opposed to the other stuff. It's like, hey, we're really good and, as, and we'll get you in and out of here in five days and you're gonna be stabilized so you won't bounce back to the hospital. Um, so all of a sudden people are really rethinking uh, what they need to be doing, you know, what their selling proposition is out there, and this whole issue of how do you manage risk in this environment. The feds have been leaning on the plans that do, that do federal programs for a long time to do something about care. Look, the plan's ability to impact what happens in an inpatient setting is substantially zero. Their ability to, ha to impact what happens in a clinic setting, well, you know, we, we tried this putting in a plan in an exam room between a doctor and a patient back in the 90s, and some of you remember how well that worked out. Uh, th that, that's not a good place for them to be. But to incent the plans to be out in the community face-to-face -face with people collecting and acting on information that can drive care and to make that a revenue-producing opportunity for them is brilliant. It's just brilliant. And it's an entirely different way to look at the system that didn't exist 10 years ago. So as you've heard a number of, uh, of us say, it's an interesting model that the government has set up, and that is you are financially incentivized to know more about your, your patient, your member. Um, so one of the things that's interesting is you might ask yourself, well, if you are interacting more with that member in order to get to know them more, doing stuff like what Jack does and doing stuff um, that we and, and others do, um, do you achieve other goals with that? Is this all about collecting data, or are other things achieved in that process? And as Jack mentioned, you know, you're, you're looking in the medicine cabinet, you're understanding their safety skills, and depending on the program, um, you can be achieving a lot. So now I'm incentivized, I, the managed care organization, am financially incentivized to really know my patient. That's mind-boggling, that's fantastic. And if I know them really well, and my data is accurate, I get paid appropriately for them. Which, um, in the process, I also am making sure I understand the patient's medications. Uh, I'm designing lots of technical platforms that make sure I'm aware of their encounters, I'm aware of their other diagnoses, I'm aware of how often they're using things because I need to make sure, I need to know where to look to get more information, more validation on things. So I need to know this person's view on the healthcare landscape, and I will tell you, in all the analytics we've done, it drives dramatic decreases in utilization. ER rates fall by 25, 27% inside of seven months in some of the studies we've done. Um, membership turnover decreases by 12 to 18%. Number of duplicate medications drop, and, and so on. So there are a lot of trickle-down benefits, 
At the same time, although not the topic of today's discussion, you have very similar akin incentivization programs around quality. You'll know them as the STARS program. It's the five-star program for Medicare that's eight to $10 billion. It's a big deal. Um, if you get a star score below three for three years in a row, government can strip your license from you. Oh, and by the way, they send letters to your members telling them, are you aware that you're in a low quality plan? It's fantastic for marketing. If you get a four star plan, they say, you know what? You must be doing something right. I'm gonna take this money from the two star plan and I'm gonna give it to you because you're doing something right. Accelerated Darwinism. And if you get a five star, they say, you know what? I'm going to waive more laws than I should be able to unless I'm the U.S. government. I'm going to allow you year-round enrollment. I'm going to break all sorts of monopoly rules that are implied within our laws. I'm going to allow you to have all of your cake because you're clearly doing something right. I'm going to give you tons of extra money, I'm going to allow you to enroll members year-round, and I'm going to send them a letter telling them you're great, and I'm going to post it on federal websites that say you got five stars. That's a pretty darn significant incentive. Medicaid programs are doing the same. And on December 10th, CMS announced that, if you look at question number 10 on the FAQs on CMS's announcement on December 10th, they're rolling out the same program for the commercial program. So quality incentive is going alongside of risk adjustment incentive. It ties together to, it pays to know your member. Now how sophisticated is your system to do that? Um, and it is big dollars, way more than the profit margins of any of these organizations. In terms of other benefits, what about on the provider side, incidental to the collection of these massive amounts of data on the underlying members, I understand that the techniques also allow the plans to collect information on the providers and profile them as to who's doing what and what their efficiency and quality is. Can someone speak to you know, how the techniques are being employed or whether you view that as a, as a material part of the, the business? Let me let Keith do that one, but let me, let me put a slightly different spin on it. Um, what you can do that makes a demonstrable difference. So, so here's an example. Uh, we, when we go in to see somebody, uh, we do all kinds of data collection that's required by various parts of, of government programs uh, that just is onerous for a physician. We do frailty assessments. We do screens for psychiatric disease. We do screens for drug and alcohol abuse. Um, we actually pull medicines out of the medicine cabinet. Why would why would the plans not know that? I mean, especially if they're Part D plans and and have the and have the claims. It's because the members are taking stuff they got from the VA, from a four dollar Walmart generic, from their wife, or samples from one of the five and a half physicians that each one of them sees. Nobody knows what the medication list is unless you look in the medicine cabinet. We can make the primary care physician's job immensely easier by going in and spending an hour or an hour and a half collecting data that they either don't have access to or don't have time to collect. So we are of value to that, to them. We, we consciously make a big effort to be of value to them and, and that's a big benefit in the system. Now as to profiling the providers, Keith, you, I mean, Jack, I mean, he's absolutely right. Um, you know, so one of the things we put together is a system called EPASS, Electronic Patient Assessment Solution Suite. And we said, let's take all the data that exists in the world about this member and let's put it in one place. So we have about 6.5 billion medical events in our system. Um, uh, it's, it's probably the largest healthcare data set in, in the country. And all of that boils down into each member, all their medications, all their encounters, all their past medical history, all their predictive disease progressions. You've had this disease for a while. You're having these lab uh, progressions. You, we should be checking your kidney function. We should be looking at your eye exams. We should be looking at these things that are consistent with this disease pattern. Um, we put all these analytics into this platform and we serve it up to the providers in their office. It comes wireless or wired, so you can walk around with your tablet and have instant access to, did you know your patient was seen across town yesterday? Did you know your patient is getting these medications that are the exact same chemical but a different brand name? Um, did you know that your patient has this past medical history? I don't know about you all, but judging by the age, uh, average age in the room, call. Uh, your parents and ask them how they're doing. Depending on your parents' uh, personality, they'll probably say they're fine. 
Um, they have a lot of medical conditions. My mom's a Medicare Advantage member. You ask her how she's doing, she says she's fine. You need to do what are called leading questions. You actually need to know the answer before you ask the question, or else you don't get the answer. You get one or two answers instead of the whole picture. So the provider is hugely benefiting, right? Doctors actually, you know, Jack and I are both physicians. Doctors actually go into medicine because they give a darn. The system weighs them down a little bit. There's a little bit of bureaucracy, a little paperwork, a little few things that get in the way, drives a few of us out of primary care and other things but they want to do the right thing. You give them a tool set. When I was in an emergency room, I'm internal medicine also, but when I was in the internal, uh, in, in an emergency room, someone rolls in with asthma, you don't know what to do with them. So you have to go full court press. You don't know if this person is going to be sucking on plastic in 10 minutes or one nebulizer is going to turn around and you're going to send them home. If you knew their history of what happens to them, you're going to save a lot of taxpayers a lot of money, do the patient a better job, get you on to the next patient sooner, make your shift in the ER better. Literally, this is one of those technologies that everyone is winning. Patients winning, the providers winning, the payers winning, the taxpayers winning, um, because the right information pre-digested together with the right interventional capability, you can't just tell them where they need to be shooting, you got to give them a gun, um, but um, it all benefits uh, everybody through methods that Jack does and through uh, other tools uh, as well. So look, we're, we're 10 years into risk adjustment exactly this year. I, I would contend with you as investors that in 2003, we would not have had this discussion because these businesses didn't exist. Uh, we actually, there, there still aren't a huge number of these businesses out there. Uh, the number, I think, is, is, is pretty small. It's harder than it looks. Uh, well, it's, it partially is harder than it looks, but maybe not that hard. But, but it's also young. Uh, I would strongly contend that if we had this discussion 10 years from now, uh, there'd be tons of these businesses around because the ability to do these businesses is here, the incentive to do the businesses is here. In some sense, the political will to do the businesses is here. Uh, I think that you're just seeing the bare beginning of what's going to be actually quite a large and beneficial industry in this country. So, so that's a good segue to my final question for our panelists, and maybe Sundar, you can feel this one. Uh, the question is just looking out into the future, and you know, Jack and others have touched on this a little bit. Um, looking out into the future, three to five years out, even longer, um, can you speak to how you see the industry being changed um, as a result of healthcare reform, more consumer-directed healthcare, uh, increased member engagement in the process, um, and what all that, how, how all that might impact relative to, to this industry. Sure, so just to bring it home, I think we touched on a few different points, like I think um, what Jack and Keith and Sean touched on. One, so by segment, let's take that, right? So commercial, what is happening because of ACA? Traditionally, people used to pick, benef you know, pick, uh, cherry pick um, healthier folks and be able to adjust premiums using underwriting which is not possible anymore, right? So, um, and then with the advent of exchanges, you are now having standardized product designs that you need to sell across broadly. So risk adjustment, there is no way that you're going to survive without risk adjustment. So there's a whole trend there on the commercial segment to really now incent it to actually engage with the member, not just to get the premiums uh, for the revenues, but actually transform care. And then in Medicaid, um, there is a whole, so there's population, populations that were never in this managed care system that's actually coming back into, um, um, into being managed by these plans that um, now have to get into different kinds of care delivery issues, many of which I think was touched on here, in, which, which is much broader than anybody's envisioned or worked on in the past, right? It's at their homes, it's in their community settings, it's in the long-term care settings, it's actually getting them out of the hospitals. In the traditional programs that was in the hospitals, not even there now. So um, there's a whole aspect around duals in Medicaid in that trend. And then on Medicare, I think that, um, uh, you talked about the pause, kind of this um, accelerated dynamism as profit pool, and but there's actually a huge disincentive, right? You're going to, uh, if you look at what's happening in Medicare Advantage now, three, four years out, um, after full ICA is fully in effect, um, we think there's a 12 to 14 percent rate cut, right? There's no way that you're going to survive in that kind of rate environment without taking true costs out of the system. And so it's very clear, if I were a betting guy, I would say 
half the plans are not going to exist that do Medicare plans today. There's like 380 plans that are filed for Medicare Advantage now. Um, and with that, plus the star rating, um, it's, it's incredible. There's going to be few players that really figure out that you've got to engage with members in a different way. Now let's really look at how, that, how will that look two, three years out, right? Um, I think there is a lot of discussion around, um, we had around um, actual like vendors and technology companies helping collect better data and engaging care. Um, but that's just the primary order effect, right? Um, the secondary kind of or uh, true care delivery innovation that's going to have to go with that is incredible. So for instance, there are clients that we're working with now that are saying, um, wow, this is seven, 70 million calls I receive in a year from my members. I used to think of this as I'm answering an eligibility question or a benefit question and a defect that I need to get done quickly and shift them to a web or a whatever self-service, right? Now, heck, my clinical, clinical predictive models tell me that more than half of the people that I need to be engaging with are actually calling me through, mm -hmm. during the year. And I, here I am, I'm trying to spend you know, 10 calls a year or trying to even get out um, you know, other um, care coordinators into their home. And you know, anybody that's worked with Medicare uh, folks understand the best way to actually engage with them is when they call you. Mm -hmm. And so how do I change my business model to really look at um, segmenting the customers, understanding what are they truly needing? And what are they trying to get achieve? And how do I link my, my objectives to that? Right? How do I link my objectives to reduce care costs, which in turn is understanding what their risks are and understanding how I can actually help service needs for them and, um, and, and matching those. And, and then there are a lot of different products, technology, as well as you know, services that can actually go around that ecosystem. But that's a very different way of thinking about things that's never happened in health. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's exciting. And it's exciting in spite of a lot of, um, you know, I think CMS released, as many of you know, the final rate release in April. And people were actually ecstatic that it wasn't as bad as the proposed letters. But if you see, it, it's actually dramatic rate cuts. And it's exciting in spite of that because it actually gives people that are innovating a chance to win and retain an unusual advantage. Well, you know, one thing I'd say, I'd be cautious about the rate cut things because I think there may have been a political bargain in the process in terms of, of, of a nomination. So, uh, but I think to, to your point, you're absolutely right that like a lot of these plans are looking at stuff differently. The star point rating point you're talking about, if you have healthy members and you're being rated, they're generally going to be happy with your plan because if they haven't had a thing. It's the ones who are really sick or cranky. And the ones are most. If, the, if you're not doing stuff to to bond with them or reach with them and 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 and, and engage with them, they're the ones who are most likely to to give you a negative rating. I think just on, on a broader level, you know, in my perspective is that we have we are fast and or vastly in the process of seeing fee for service die as a payment methodology, uh, and you're starting to see a lot more of that in terms of all the things you've talked about in terms of how do you reimburse folks. Um, who are providing care, they have to have a different value proposition. I personally also think, given the advent of the exchanges, um, the exchanges are a real game changer that I don't think people really get the full impact of yet. Um, you know, Keith is absolutely right in terms of it really creates a focus on being able to have multiple skill sets and either you're going to be super successful or die on an accelerated basis. Uh, but I also think that the, as a result of the exchanges in five years will be the death of employer-sponsored health care. Uh, because for most employers, uh, I don't think they want to be or should be in the business of picking a health plan, but there's no, there's no place to go for, for coverage with the exchanges you have that. So for folks who have an employer-based model, I also happen to think that you know, perhaps because of the desire to get rid of, of, of tax breaks, uh, it will accelerate it more. But I think the, ad, the exchanges have made it so that uh, the entire employer-based market and, and companies who are based on that are going to have some very challenging times. Just to close it out, let me tell you a quick business business model that, I, that is exactly what Sundar is talking about. There's a, there's, you, you may or may not know a little company called Social Service Coordinators. It's a big company called Social Service Coordinators that's now part of Altegra that's owned by Welsh Carson. Here's the SSC business model. They go to Medicare Advantage plans and they use data to find people that they think should be dually eligible, that they think should be on Medicaid as well. And they reach out to those people. And when in each locality around the country, they have a database 
of the available services. So they call and they say, gee, you need help with your heating oil? Having trouble with transportation? Can we get somebody to take you to your pharmacist? They go through the whole collection of things that make these people's lives better. And at the very end, they say, oh yeah, by the way, we also have the Medicaid application here. Can we help you fill that out? Because that makes a payment straight to the MA plan. It's a brilliant business model. It's just brilliant. That's just, there are so many models out there in this system right now that can be built like that. Just hide and watch. This is going to be a really interesting space for the next eight or 10 years. It's really going to be fun. Great. Keith, any, any closing remarks? I think my colleague said it well. Okay. Thanks. Um, any questions for our panelists? I, I have a question about the, uh, the state exchanges, the commercial exchanges. And this is just from the last case, especially for Keith and Jack. Um, uh, a lot of the folks coming on board with this, the exchanges will be folks without prior history of insurance. So my suspicion is that there will be a lack of historic data to do analytics on. You also spoke about how important it is to identify the high-risk folks in this population because there's high variability in risk. So do you see, Keith, do you see that as a, as a challenge or how do, you, how do you plan to address that challenge? And then Jack, how do you see the adaptability of the face-to-face -face, uh, you know, model in that, in that commercial space? So um, I, I, it is a challenge. It's, fun. it's a fun and great challenge. So um, let me tell you how you deal with it. You're absolutely right. So um, to give you a little bit more detail than you want, uh, members coming into the exchange are going to come in in a few different ways, right? So you've got grandfathered people in the commercial space which don't need to come in at all. They'll come in as they eventually come off their grandfathering uh, programs. <laughs> you then have members in small and individual um, categories that are going to come in as they age off of their legacy policy, so it's kind of area under the curve, one twelfth a month on average, but it's it actually the, the, the population is a different uh, trend than that. Um, and then you have these previously uninsured or Medicaid members. You're absolutely right. So a um, couple different things. First of all, those members have had a high oscillation through other programs over the years. So the data is out there. So if you have a huge coverage, Right, so we cover half of the United States already. Right, they're in there somewhere, um, and that's an enormous uh, benefit with proper adherences to HIPAA and high tech regulations as to how all of these data considerations uh, get managed. Um, so there's an ability if you already have insight into the majority of of the U.S. to gain some benefit off of that. But as you point out, there's going to be a large number of them that don't. And so that's where you have to do an intelligence. So we, we have a, a system that has taken a look at millions of these members and have looked at the associations with how they report on their own self-condition and has designed a dynamic question set that as that member's talking to you, it's quickly saying, if they answer this to that, then ask them this. And it very rapidly narrows them down into a decile uh, risk score categorization and lets you know very quickly at very low cost, very low impact, is this somebody I need to worry about? So at trivial cost, you very early on say, okay, I now know where this person is universe-wise because 75 to 82% of them are totally fine. The others are not. How do I get to where that category is? And, and so that's how you approach it very early on. There will not be enough resources over the next three years to do this properly. Um, so we, we've done a bunch of calculations as to what are the fundamental infrastructural requirements, number of actuarials, number of uh, nurse practitioners, number of analytical programmers, blah, 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 that know anything about healthcare, so on and so forth. And we, we find there's about 40 to 50% of the resources that are actually required to do this. So um, again, there will be those that get behind the eight ball, that get themselves caught up in 10 RFPs and want to examine 20 different people and make the mistake of speaking to 10 different consultants. And they will make their decisions too late in the game and will be left out in the cold and are going to get crushed. Um, but the important thing is, is know your member, low cost, low impact ways to get insight early and then you feed upon it with interaction with the right members. Is there value using the consumer data of this category? Oh, absolutely. We layer in demographic data, we layer in census data, we layer in tax data. We, I mean, you're doing huge profiles. Uh, we do this in 98.2% of the counties of the United States. So every single provider 
Uh, we know, you know, if this member literally just tells us where they've been seen before, where have you ever gone to be seen, we know the profile of that hospital, the profile of the physician, we know whether or not they're, you know, preferentially this way, or it, it, I mean, it's, it's know thy audience to the, to the nth degree. And the, the practical nuts and bolts answer is that for three years there are risk corridors and reinsurance so yeah. that they have they have brackets around the, the plans going in have brackets around the risk so the the pent-up demand previously uninsured question uh, has is is blunted but i would although jack's absolutely right so as they did in the early years of the 2003 medicare modernization they put crutches on it right they did all these rule bending aspects of how we're supposed to have corporate uh, equality here in this great country in order to make it so that people preferentially had a benefit to venture into the medicare advantage world well they put crutches on this as well um, but I'll ask you how many, you know, go, go look up any of your publicly trading managed care organizations, how many of them can afford a plus or minus 3% swing in their financial performance? So yes, there are 3% corridors around this. How many people don't care about 6% of profit margin? So um, this will not in and of and by itself be the death toll on or organizations, but damn, it's gonna hurt a lot if they don't get it right. May speak to why they're not really pushing the enrollment very much right now either. Well, to, to, that, to that point, I don't know, there's a bunch of articles floating around, not a lot of people have put attention to them. The federal government has hired what are called uh, uh, um, health uh, advocates, health navigators. Uh, navigators. All right, 21,000 of them in California alone. Okay, so this is a nice little, it's not on the, the, the PL of what is uh, the, the Reform Act. But it's a nice little way for the Obama administration to, A, get the states to agree with it. Let me help you with your unemployment rate. Uh, I'm going to pay for 21,000 people to be employed in your state. And let me make a nice little way of making this not show up as a cost of, of health care reform. Um, I kind of equate it to the TSA program. But um, 21,000 people in California, just to put this across, that's roughly one for every 150 people projected to go into the health care exchange in California next year. So that means I only have to call a person every two days and I'm doing my job as a healthcare advocate. But I will tell you, for people like Jack and me, that is 21,000 people that are my marketing people that are driving people to my business model. So I have to embarrassingly say as a taxpayer, I'm not entirely against it. Um, but uh, I mean, there are some weird things going on out there that are just pushing business into these models. One other question. Yeah, I was wondering about your um, thoughts on uh, a dynamic that I see, at least that there's two forces at play that I see. Uh, when it comes to the payers, we see uh, you know, this data collection aggregation. This, this is a big challenge. We, we call it like building a rocket ship, right? And there's not very many that have done that, although there's a lot of people that are now trying to do that. So on one hand, it seems like there's natural forces of monopoly at play here, meaning it makes sense for one person to kind of do this and everybody to sort of feed off of that. On the other hand, no one, there's, it, it's not a dominant thing yet in the market, so there's probably a lot of opportunity for innovation along the entire value chain of just getting the data, making it usable, and then doing something with it. Where do you see, how do you see these two forces pan out? A really interesting question. So, so a couple things to think of, right? So take a few of your large managed care players. Let's purposely not name any of them. Um, and you know some of them have grown organically. That's pretty rare. They all grow through acquisitions, right? Some of them are basically maxed out, right? They can barely do acquisitions and get it through Hart Scott Redino, right? So, um, um, how do they grow? Well, this is how they grow. So if you can't acquire anybody anymore, um, you basically make it so that your competition in an area can't financially succeed. So if you are a large player, okay, and you say. I want to be dominant in that state. I can't buy a plan in that state anymore. So I'm in 50 states or I'm in 30 states or 40 or 15 or whatever. All I do is lower my premium 50 bucks for like two years, just bankrupted my competition in that state. And I didn't have to acquire anybody. So, I mean, you're going to see some really wacky corporate strategies going on here. If you look at Vermont, you know, they're all really tight in their premium numbers. So nobody's really caught on to that strategy issue in, in Vermont. But you're going to see some people go, you know what? You're at 340, you're at 360, you're at 390. I'm at 220, you know? You know, because I can take that balance sheet hit. It's a lot cheaper than buying another company, 
Right? If, you, if you do the math on it, I can get 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 members at a low, low cost. And, and sure, eventually it'll rebalance, you know, uh, but if you want to look at the calendar of when that cash flow flows back to you, so data is due April 30th, 2015, and then go through, a re to make a long story short, you have to have balance sheet strength to survive for about two years. Sure, it all actuarially or financially accrues to this year, but how cash strong are you to survive that number of years to allow that roll forward? So you're going to see some really neat dynamics, interesting dynamics, however you, you, know, you, you want to view it, going on in, in the space around this. I don't know how they're going to regulate that. Right. I would add, we actually did an interesting analysis of looking across the payers' value chain. So because you're really asking, they're not good at it, should they be doing it? We looked across the value chain and said, okay, if the future is the way it's headed, that you're tremendous pressure on, you know, truly impacting cost and value, we took out all the costs that are not doing that, right? And getting into a business model, so if you look at all their administrative costs of like administering benefits, answering calls, all that, and truly value-added areas where, you know, like data analytics, um, in actually care coordination, you can actually run a plan with $5, right? $5 PMPM. And it's just a challenge to the industry, right? So what that means is you really are at an inflection point. You we can't cost think more about than that. it. Sorry? So we cost more than that. So you couldn't be hiring us if you're on $5 PMPM. Well, it depends on the pay payment structure, right? Um, so it's really then how, what, do you, what do you do and what do you need to be doing are at an inflection point, right? That you, it's very, really changing in the industry. We're, uh, we're going to wrap things up now. Thank you very much for your patience, and uh, thanks to all our panelists for their... <laughs>